Welcome back to Block TV. It's time now for Chain Breakers. Now, the internet as it stands today has failed to live up to the egalitarian standards of free and fair transfer of information that defined its early founding. This definition coming at least according to the guys at Threefold Foundation, who are working to recreate what they call the people's internet, a blockchain enabled platform that works to decentralize the online world. For details of the project, I'm joined now by Christophe de Spiglier, CEO and founder of the Threefold Foundation. Christophe, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Welcome. All right. So to start off, to help explain a little bit about what the Threefold project is, how the foundation works and how the whole notion of a uh, people's internet could come about. <laughs> so it's a result of a long dream. Um, the internet as we know it today is owned by not that many companies. There are less than 20 companies in the world who own more than 80% of the capacity. And if we say the capacity, we mean not the cables by itself, but the storage, the compute capacity, which makes up the applications we use in our daily life. Our dream is to sort of turn that around. And instead of having these massive data centers, which by the way, today use more than 5% of the energy production in the world, we would like to fully decentralize this. So we're building out a network of lots of boxes which go everywhere in the world. And this network is provided by our community. And in such a way, this becomes a network of decentralized capacity. And we call this like a new internet, which can be used for all kinds of workloads. All right. So, I mean, uh, any of the, anyone uh, familiar with the cryptocurrency and blockchain space will understand uh, the notions of what you're talking about, about a decentralized, you know, node-based internet. But can we really expect such a system to compete with the behemoths that exist uh, out there now in the already established centralized internet? As you said, those 20 companies out there that uh, control approximately 80% of the power uh, inside the internet, I mean, surely they have been motivated by uh, that centralization focus. I mean, uh, how, how are we expecting a decentralized internet to be motivated enough to compete with the one that currently exists? Well, there are many elements to this question. Um, first and for all, the internet is growing extremely fast. And even those big companies realize that the way how they're building data centers today is not going to cut it. There are many workloads like Internet of Things, self-driving cars, AI, which simply cannot be done in the way how we build out the Internet today. There are estimates who claim that we need more than 4,000 massive data centers in the next couple of years if we continue the growth like we're doing today. And if you know that a large-scale data center can be up to a billion dollar investment, you can see that we're talking about a huge needed investment to, to let the Internet grow. This is not possible um, because of 5G and all of the other things happening. We need this internet to be much closer to us. If you are today, as an example, in Africa, everything you do will first go to Europe or America and back. And it's a very non-efficient way of doing it. So we need a new way, something which works in a very fundamentally different way. Now, we by origin are not blockchain guys. For more than 20 years, we have been working on technology around the internet in fact, almost 30 years. And we have always been very passionate about how can we rethink the way how such a network is supposed to be. So we finally, after all of these years, came up with a new system. And that system is fundamentally different. It requires a lot less energy. It's much more cost effective. And the main um, change is that you don't need people to operate it. So as such, this new system is very different. It's not just trying to copy what the big guys do, mm -hmm. but it's to provide an alternative, which is very, very different. It's an alternative, which is, like I said, so much more green. It's more scalable. It's closer to you. As such, it will be faster. And it's much more cost effective, which, especially in emerging countries, is something which they need. So today with our farmers, we call them farmers. So farmers are people who connect boxes pieces of hardware, on top of which they deploy our software. And as such, they build out this, this new internet and they provide a network of capacity, which is much more cost effective. Today, we have more capacity out there compared to all the blockchain companies. So that's a lot of capacity already out there today. And as such, we believe that it's not just, it's not, we don't want to compete with them. I think there will always be uh, room for these big data centers and they will be needed. But we need something next to this, which will be more at the edge, which will be faster and more efficient for all of use cases. 
And that's why we believe that as an alternative to these big data centers, this is something which needs to happen and will happen. And we, have to, we happen to be in the right place at the right time. So I, I got to wonder there, though, Christoph. I mean, we talk about uh, you know having a spreading capacity around the world and increases potentially to efficiency, a changing of the model, uh, all uh, very uh, you know noble goals to be sure. But in terms of what we've seen, for example, in established blockchains, and I think to uh, Bitcoin uh, as a prime example of a truly decentralized blockchain that despite the fact of its decentralization, has fundamentally seen a centralizing of uh, much of its resources in large mining pools. You know, as we see a huge concentration of the hash rate coming out of uh, you know, particular provinces in China. Uh, the fact of the matter is that where there's money and where there's uh, a potential for efficiency, there is inevitably a form of, uh, you know, I won't say centralization, but uh, perhaps a hub that forms around uh, capacity and power. Is the same risk not inherent in threefold system? Well, very good question. It's indeed true that most blockchain projects today are not centralized enough and uh, that could be improved. From the day we started thinking about this, we have been thinking with decentralization in mind. And I do not believe that technology by itself is enough to get to full decentralization. You have to think the way how you create the technology, how you get your coders to come to consensus about the code they create, um, how you will do your governance, how you will put your rules, how you eventually can even change them, because I'm sure that over time, certain changes will be needed. So it's much more than just technology. And for that, we have created a foundation, and this foundation is a group of people. And today, it's a group of many people, in fact, which all as a sort of human blockchain can collaborate and can also come to consensus on certain decisions which need to be taken. Now, we're not at the end of the journey there yet. So next to the technology, which is fully decentralized and it's self-healing and no people are involved, this is something which technology does. We're thinking with world experts about how can we build an organization in such a way that a lot of people can work together without centralization, because you need both. And we're not at the end of that thing yet, but I hope that let's say within a year or so, that even that human element of the work we do will be fully decentralized. We call them guardians. So basically we have technology guardians, we have governance guardians, guardians, and all of these guardians together, they need to provide the consensus about things which need to happen in the future. And yeah, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's really, really difficult and it will require a lot more thought over the next year. But I'm confident that within a year or so, we will be 100% decentralized from a technical perspective and from a human perspective at the same time. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, looking beyond the, uh, so the technical side of things, assuming uh, you know, the technology can be, can be built and implemented uh, as envisioned, let's talk a little bit about sort of the, the real world application and development deployment of this technology. Because as it stands right now, there are a lot of very powerful, wealthy, vested interests in keeping the internet as it stands now. You know, uh, and all those uh, 20 massive uh, companies that you say control the vast majority of the internet, I'm sure are uh, very happy to keep the status quo as it is. In terms of getting that adoption out there, you've said your, you know, your uh, network capacity beats that of other blockchain providers combined, but in terms of the non-blockchain uh, based internet, of course, there's incredible capacity out there. How do you Absolutely. intend to, to, to deploy that adoption and get that change? I mean, obviously, it'll be a long process, but do you think you'll be able to meaningfully get adoption onto this system and move away from the system that has defined the last two decades? Yeah. Now, there, there, are, there are two levels to this question, because what we do has also two levels. One level is the capacity, which is just compute and storage, uh, and later also GPU capacity, which can be used for a number of, of, of workloads. And then there is also a layer on top, which I haven't spoken about, but let me start with maybe the second layer, which is uh, the human technical layer. So our idea is that um, it's a little bit different than blockchain. So we use a lot of blockchain technology. Uh, I look at blockchain like a very good tool to get a lot of things established, but blockchain alone is not enough for to establish something we've done. So we took a little bit of a different approach. And on this top layer, we have created something which we call a tree belt. And a tree boat is a digital, it's your digital avatar. So instead of all of us sharing one blockchain and then all have a little piece of it, which makes it super hard to scale out and to make redundant, redundant for sure, but to scale out and make performance enough. In our case, it's different. 
you get a digital avatar and each digital avatar has your full life going from storage applications anything really uh, which you need in your in your digital life and it has its own blockchain inside if you want now this is a very different way how to structure such an internet um, and this one needs this capacity layer underneath so also in our rollout, we have to work on these both angles. The first angle is the capacity layer, and that's what we are doing today. So today we have a decent amount of capacity out, but you're very right, compared to the big boys, it is very small. Um, that being said, there is, we have some very good partners like HPE and others who want to help to push this on a global basis. And together with them, we are confident that we can, with our farmers as well, of course, that we can push out enough capacity in the field so that it becomes a viable alternative to these big data centers. Now, centralization is the most thing here, like we discussed before. Without centralization, we can never make this happen. Um, sometimes we compare what we do with solar panels. Instead of taking energy from a nuclear plant, which would be like a data center today, which is not very efficient if you think about it. If you are in Africa and you need energy, you don't want to take that energy from America nuclear plant, right, or from Europe. Well, but this is exactly what we do for the internet today. So instead of building these nuclear plants, which we probably still need, we build these solar panels everywhere. And that's like what we do. So the solar panel represents the capacity which we put everywhere. And now it can go much faster and as such become um, an alternative to uh, all of these um, nuclear plants, if you want, these big data centers. So we have the people building out that network and as such they have an economical interest to do so because they farm the capacity, they get tokens because of it, and that's the, their economic interest. So we believe that through decentralization, through providing an economic interest to our farmers, to having it at the edge of the network, it becomes a true viable alternative to these big data centers. So that's the, this layer number one, right, which is how can we provide the capacity? And now what can we do with this capacity? We don't want to reinvent the way how people use the cloud today. Today, there are certain standards like S3 storage, Docker containers, Kubernetes. So on this capacity layer, we allow anyone to use the tools they used to. So they can just use Kubernetes or, or Docker containers and they can move their existing workloads or new workloads onto our capacity network. But the access path is a little bit different. But well, first of all, it will be closer to where the users are. And secondly, it gets deployed through sort of blockchain, so it will provide them with much more security. And then later on, there will be in the second wave, we can provide more um, attention to this yeah, application layer. Uh, think about it like a decentralized application layer where developers, web developers can use our frameworks and can use our capacity everywhere to create the alternative to any web application today, mm. but in a fully decentralized manner. And this will um, require us to do a lot of evangelization. So step one, easy. We link to the existing use cases. We make it super easy for any developer or any system administrator to create their workloads by using standard tools at the edge. Of course, we'll have to do a lot of this before that. And then later on, we will also go to application developers, mm -hmm. which can build applications on top. I must say, Christoph, you have a wonderful way of uh, painting a, a very clear picture there. I thoroughly appreciate that. But uh, as we go on, I want to ask uh, about one other key point, which I think uh, is central to this conversation, uh, and a conversation that has uh, sort of plagued uh, the early internet uh, since it came into being, and that notion of security. Uh, so many uh, talk about the fact that you know the internet as it's designed today was designed as an open platform and security was an afterthought not put into full spectrum. I, I believe I'm aware that you guys have a bit more of an attention and focus to that security. So could you talk us through uh, how Threefold intends to handle that issue? No, you're right. Security was not, I, I was lucky um, as a kid and also when I was in university. Um, I was always, I was there when the internet got born and, and, and was part of it actually. And it was a very fun time. It was really amazing. And yes, security was a complete afterthought. And we still see these issues today, the way how email works and the way how we go to websites. And yeah, it's very, very difficult today in the current internet to provide security. Now, if we look in the way how we, we had to rethink this completely, because of course it's question number one, right? People say, yeah, but wait a minute, if I put my capacity everywhere and it's going to be in potentially millions of places, how can you make sure that these places will not be hacked? 
or that the data will always be there. So if, what, what if we lose a site or a computer or some disk or a network, will my application always be up and running? So we had to really rethink how do we need to build such a system? And like I said before, we are by nature not blockchain guys. Uh, blockchain for us, it's, 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 it's really great what happens and it allows us to do a lot of things which were impossible before, but we see it like a tool. But it took us more than 15 years to come up with alternative ways how to store data, how to protect your workloads, how to get secure network connectivity between the applications. And we had to rethink it from scratch. Now, how did we do it? We had to rebuild an operating system from scratch. Many people say, you're insane. Why would you rebuild um, an operating system? So basically what we did, we took the Linux kernel because otherwise you have to rewrite drivers and that's really too hard. And then um, once the kernel boots, everything else running in there has been coded by us. Mm -hmm. So this operating system is really, really tiny. It's very small. It's very low level to the hardware and it has no shell. It has no server interface. It has no what they call RPC interface, remote procedure call interface. And as such, there is no surface for hackers to do anything with. But if you take away all of these interfaces to the operating system, how can you get this operating system to do something for you as a user of the system? So that's why where this blockchain comes in. So we have our, what we call blockchain database. And in that blockchain database, you have to register your workloads in a rather low level format. And these nodes, these millions of nodes will only listen to these, think about it like a smart contract for IT. So you define what you need, you put it on a blockchain, and then you can get consensus between people. And once you get consensus between people, only then these nodes will take that workload or the definition of that workload from that blockchain and will execute it. So it's a much more secure way how you can define your workload, how it can get executed. And I can talk about it for many hours, but we had to rethink every layer, the file system layer, the, the virtual disks, the networking, the way how the operating system works to make sure that anywhere in there, people have no um, connection to it. So the biggest safety comes because of the fact that there is no hacking surface. Um, it's completely 100% self-healing. So even the person itself, once you launch it, you have to provide your consensus again before you can actually do something. So a hacker has nothing to attack. So it's rather rather different in design. But it's probably too much to sort of explain uh, in this interview where all the details I would say. <laughs> Certainly. A lot of technical details to get into, but I think the overarching point is clear. A system design with security in mind, uh, very different to the one that we're running on today. Oh, well, Christoph, I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to break down this project. It sounds like you really thought about uh, what's going on here. There's so many stages still to implement and develop. I look forward to seeing how Threefold goes into the future, how it develops and grows into the future. But in the meantime, thanks so much for being with us. And for those at home, thank you so much for watching and stay with us at blocktv.com for all the latest in news and information. I'm Asher Westrop Evans. Thanks for watching. For more news and updates, follow us on Twitter.